Good morning. It's time to get started. If you have your Bibles with you, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about what is um, called often the Great Commission. That will be our class. We're going to look at three different places in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of um, They're not all the same occasion, but they are uh, similar messages um, this morning. Uh, does anyone have any updates to our prayer request list that we have here in our bulletin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lord found him yesterday. Okay. I So if you didn't hear that, Lauren uh, Shackelford fell yesterday. I said maybe dehydration. Is that probably? Uh, they gave him fluids and stuff yesterday. Okay. But didn't injure himself. Just, uh, just had to go to the ER. He fell at home. Yeah, fell at home. Okay. So uh, my nephew, Elijah, this is my brother's son, uh, is still in the hospital. Uh, they had a consult with the doctor last night trying to figure out if they should move him to um, to PICU or to keep him where he was. They, they decided to keep him where he was in a regular room. 
but yeah, he's just struggling with RSV, and uh, they say probably today it's going to be his hardest day. I'd say day five is just hard. I, it's just part of the virus. So, uh, but he's on oxygen. They said his oxygen levels are, are doing pretty good. Uh, when he can keep calm, that's kind of hard for a. Uh, he's only, boy, he's born in August, right, Bethany? So only four months old. So, yeah, baby Elijah, they call him Eli sometimes. You'll see that on my Facebook um, down in uh, Panama City, Florida. Uh, so remember them. Yeah, that's great. Good to hear. I know it wasn't fun, but... Uh, You wish you were. <laughs> yeah. So we'll thank God for the Von Ells good report. Yes. Okay. She's showing a lot of symptoms or? Okay. Hmm. All right. So Molly Cook, she, she has COVID right now. Uh, so remember her. Right. Yeah, they're, they're still, still down. It's been a whole week. Hopefully they'll feel better uh, here soon. Okay. Uh, you said a cousin of yours? Your cousin? Yes. Okay, so Thomas Bartman, uh, Shirley's cousin, uh, is uh, having kidney failure and is going to probably start dialysis here soon. So you said inflamed lymph nodes, right? Okay. Do they, they don't believe it's lymphoma, do they? Well, actually they said it's something they just need to watch. Okay. So, yeah, so Connie Lynn. <clears throat> So Connie Linder, Linderman has inflamed lymph nodes. They're going to do some immunotherapy on her uh, starting soon. So, baby, still doing good. All right. How's the baby healing up? Okay. It's going to be a long, long uh, road for her. I'm, was it usually six weeks? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, uh, we're so grateful, Lord, uh, for you and what you've done for us and uh, who you are to us, how you are holy, that you are perfect, that you are kind and loving, that you are just, that you forgive us when we fail, that you want to be involved in our lives and you want a relationship with us. Thank you, Lord, for being you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for helping us through each day. This morning we ask that you will help uh, those who are struggling with their health through this day. Uh, we pray for Molly Cook, help her through uh, her COVID, and we pray, Lord, that um, the symptoms will be light for her and uh, that she will feel better soon. Uh, we pray for Lauren, and um, I pray, Lord, that you'll help him through... Um, through uh, recovering from this fall, and uh, that that uh, there'll be something done here soon that will prevent him from falling again. 
We pray for uh, my nephew Elijah. Help him, Lord, uh, through this RSV and be with his parents as they take care of him. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with um, Connie and the immunotherapy that she will start soon. We pray everything will go well with that and the inflammation will go down. We pray for Thomas Bartman as, uh, as he is uh, going to have dialysis here soon. We pray that uh, everything will go smoothly on that. Uh, we pray for those who are grieving. We pray for uh, Wilma Parks as she um, is grieving over the loss of her sister Shirley. And we pray you will be with uh, the service tomorrow as they say goodbye. We pray for Sonny Rickman and his PET scan this week. We pray everything will look good and there will be progress made. Be with Don and Rick Holden and their health problems and as they grieve over the loss of Pauletta. Continue to be with uh, Noah as he um, adjusts to coming back home. That you'll be with um, the Plum family, especially Vicki as she heals, as they take care of these new twins. Be with Betty Stewart as she is recovering from her uh, fall. Uh, we pray for Janet Langley and uh, what she's going through. Pray for the Frasers. Help them to feel better soon. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, to see Ron here this morning. And uh, we're thankful he was able uh, to, um, to be with us and, and not to feel as bad as, as he was. We're also thankful, Lord, for the Bonnells and their good report from this past week. Uh, we're, there's many more, Lord. We know there's, there's people who are um, struggling out there in the world. We know, Lord, there's a lot of people struggling spiritually and they're lost. And, and we pray, Lord, that, that we can be a light unto them, and that we can show them uh, the good news that comes with Jesus. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us this morning as we think about that good news and how we can spread it, uh, that we will um, look at our lives and see how we can be better messengers, uh, better witnesses uh, to your goodness, and how we can uh, show other people uh, the blessedness that comes in Christ. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to start off there in Matthew 28. Matthew 28 will be our first passage. To kind of give you a recap, we're looking through the different resurrection appearances um, that are found at the end of the Gospels. And um, I found Wilford's sheet, which I have here, very helpful. And I think there were some extras. They were up there, but they're somewhere around here. Uh, there's some extras of this. Uh, if you can't find it, you can have my copy or make a copy of it. But he kind of tracks through the, the different resurrection appearances uh, that we have in the New Testament that are mentioned. Uh, obviously, there could be more. John says in his book, if I were to tell you everything that Jesus did, the, the books of the world cannot contain it. And so uh, there might have been some more, um, and some of the ones that we get we're kind of fuzzy on, uh, and we'll mention that with uh, Jesus presenting himself to the 500 um, this morning. But uh, kind of going through his list and kind of tracking through where we are, uh, the first thing we saw in the Gospels was that there was a witness to the empty tomb by the women, and then later Peter and John then Jesus uh, appeared to Mary Magdalene there in the garden. He thought he was the gardener. Um, then uh, we also have a mention that he appeared to the other women as well. Uh, then we had the road to the Maus, which we studied last uh, Sunday morning in Bible class. Those two disciples, one named Cleopas, the other one, we don't know his name. And also uh, to Peter, he appeared to Peter alone. Um, the next one is uh, to the ten disciples in the upper room, all of them, uh, the twelve minus Judas and um, Thomas. And then Thomas came back, and eight days later he appeared to them again. And then the one that Wilford talked about on Wednesday was uh, the appearance there at Galilee as uh, the, the disciples were fishing. Okay, And so that uh, is kind of where we are, kind of coming up to uh, Matthew 28, uh, starting in verse 16. It says there, 
Now the, the, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Um, I'm not sure how many were able to read the commentary on this passage uh, in the truth for today. Um, but I disagree with the conclusion that, that Mr. Roper comes to. What he says is because uh, of the other appearances that we've seen in the Gospels, that the doubt here among the apostles doesn't make any sense. And so the way that he works around that is saying this is probably when Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples plus the 500 that we read about. And uh, he, let me quote exactly what he said. He said there, he said, most scholars believe this to be the case. This is when um, Jesus revealed himself uh, to the 500 disciples. Um, there's a problem with that because all the commentaries I looked at when it talked about the 500, they say, we have no clue when this happened. <laughs> and... Uh, Mr. Roper didn't show his work on that, so I have no clue who he's referring to. Uh, but kind of be wary of that when people say, oh, most everyone believes this. It's like, well, show your work a little bit. And uh, we had to do that in grad school. Uh, if we consulted commentary and we made some statement, we had to cite every single person who agreed with that, that point in uh, the footnotes, which was really nice if you didn't want to write a very long paper. You make a claim that everyone believes, and you cite them all, and it takes up half the page. So that's really nice when that happens. Um, but he said that, and I just wanted to correct that. I don't, I could not find many people saying, I, I couldn't find anyone at all actually saying that this coincided with the appearance to the 500. In fact, what does the scripture say there in verse 16? It's just the 11, right? He appeared to the 11 disciples. Uh, it said, go to the mountain uh, which Jesus had directed them. And so there was a, and Wilford did a good job of, of telling this, um, that, that was one of the directives that was first given when Jesus appeared, that he said, you know, tell the disciples, he told this to Mary, tell the disciples that I'm going before them uh, to Galilee. And so they, he goes before them to Galilee. He meets them there uh, on Galilee. And then here is another uh, instance in this area in which he he met them. Now, we're not sure which mountain this is. Traditionally, it's um, the traditional site, which if you were ever, ever to go to um, Israel, which that's one of my bucket list things to do, um, they have certain shrines and certain uh, cathedrals and certain, um, you know, monuments wherever you go to say this is the site where this happened. And um, that's another one where you're like, okay, well, you say that, but can you really back up the claim? And so there's a lot of disagreements on where things actually took place uh, there in uh, uh, Palestine, in that area. And one of those is this one. Um, the traditional site uh, that is associated with this appearance is Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor. Um, but uh, the commentaries I looked at, they think that's, that's probably not accurate. Uh, we're not really sure where it was, but Galilee is full of rolling hills, and it's likely maybe one of the ones, uh, one of the um, mountains or uh, big hills that, that are on there, there in that area was where he, he did this, um, uh, said this speech. Now, if you think about the, the Gospel of Matthew, what we find is that mountains seem to be very important to the theology of, of Matthew. And uh, think about the Bible as a whole. How are mountains important in the Bible as a whole? Okay. Right. But a lot of times, uh, I've heard sermons on this, you know, about God's at the top of the mountain, we're at the bottom. You know, we, we need to get to him, we need to be going upward. 
Yeah. Yeah, you see that a lot is that they're, if they want to they want to be in the presence of God, they'll go up on a mountain. You said Moses, I thought of Elijah too. Um, that was, for Elijah, that was kind of where he was seeking God, was there on the mountaintop. And so uh, that's something that's not just um, unique to Judaism. That's also something that was uh, in the, the culture at that time, is that if you needed to, to see God, if you needed to talk with God, you would go up. And even in Babylon, they have these things called uh, ziggurats. Ziggurats, uh, they are with the um, Babylonian religion. And they built these massive um, buildings with steps up to it so they could get closer uh, to God. And so uh, that was kind of in their mindset. Now, uh, when it comes to Matthew, how are mountains important? Okay, so Jesus is, uh, give, he gives the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. So he goes up on the mountain, he gives his law, he's the new Moses. Can you think of another one? All right, the transfiguration. So he goes up there, he sees uh, Moses, and you see Elijah, and uh, that's when God is able to tell those three disciples, uh, this is my son, listen to him. And so you have that. And then here, the final one is here at the Great Commission. And so um, I'm not real sure if, if there's, um, <clears throat> I don't think there's much, uh, at least I don't know any meaning behind being on the mountain, except it seems like important things happen on the mountain in Matthew. And I think this is one of the most important things that Jesus communicates to his disciples uh, as he is resurrected from the dead and as he's about to ascend to heaven. All right. Um, also notice here in verse 17 that when they saw Jesus, they worshipped. And uh, as far as uh, the gospel of Matthew is concerned, this is the first time that he records the disciples seeing Jesus. And so when they see the resurrected Jesus, their immediate reaction is to worship. Can you think of any t other times where Jesus appeared to someone uh, after being resurrected and the worship was immediate? Women. Okay, the women. Okay. The women, they, they worshiped. Uh, I think of uh, uh, Mary in particular, right? Uh, this is in verse 9, actually. Um, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. All right. So you have that one. Can you think of another time where this one might not be explicit about the word worship, but um, I think it's, it's close enough. We looked at it last week in our sermon. When Thomas saw Jesus resurrected, he said, My Lord, my God. Okay. Um, worship only belongs to God. And so by them worshiping Jesus, they're saying, you are God. Okay, that's another confirmation. And I was talking to, to Jeremy about this last week. We were talking about some skeptics to uh, the gospel, and we were mentioning um, a popular atheist named uh, Bart Ehrman. I'm not sure if y'all have read any of his works. Uh, I don't think very much of his works, very highly of his works, but I remember seeing an interview of him one time where his whole, his whole thesis of the book was that it wasn't until later times, specifically at the writing of the Gospel of John, that people viewed Jesus as the Son of God. He actually says Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't view him as the Son of God, not as God in the flesh. And all I want to do is saying, did you, did you miss these parts where they actually like bowed down and worshipped him? I mean, that is uh, essentially saying that Jesus is God. This is not some later development. This is who Jesus presented himself to be. Uh, so verse 17, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And the question we have is, how could they doubt after all they had seen already? I don't think necessarily that he was the Christ. I think the doubt and prove this, you know, tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, I think the doubt was more on is he really resurrected? That's uh, my take. 
especially in how Matthew unfolds, where this is the first time he hears to him. If you think chronologically, it doesn't make sense how they could be doubting at this point. But I think all of us can look within ourselves, and, and even if we've been a Christian a decade, two decades, or seven decades, we can say, you know, there are some times where I doubt, even though I've seen undeniable proof that God is real, that he is at work in my life, and that Jesus is the Son of God. And so uh, the fact that they mentioned this, the fact that Matthew mentioned this, by the way, he would have been among that group of people there, the eleven. It just shows that uh, we humans, we struggle with our faith. And that's okay. Uh, Keep worshiping and keep listening to Jesus. And uh, we'll see uh, next year as you guys go into the Acts of the Apostles, a a transformed disciples, I think. The apostles really um, changed from these doubtful, unsure people to very bold proclaimers of the message of Christ to be faithful to him no matter what might happen. By the way, Dennis, the material came in for that. It's on the desk in there. I just thought about it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So the, um, the Life of Christ um, series that we've done this year, uh, they made a sequel to it, and the, the Apostles. It's only 52 lessons versus this one has been, what is it, 129, I think. Um, and so... Uh, starting in January, uh, it's you, Dennis, right? You're going to start off teaching on Sunday morning uh, through the commentaries. Um, we have, I think, four um, sets of them in there, but if you wanted to and you actually use it, um, let the elders know, and, and we can order some more uh, for you. I know uh, maybe this last year was a test to see if you would actually use it or not, um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be an encouraging step. And so uh, just talk to the elders if, you, if you'd like uh, a set of those. All right. Reminds me of a sermon I heard recently from my long lips, you know. Uh, yeah, seeing, the, seeing does not always equal believing. And plenty of people saw Jesus' miracles. Some said he was from Beelzebul. Some said that uh, they wanted to see more. And some were marveling and amazed and believed. So there's different responses. Uh, so, yeah, um, Jesus says, blesses are those who, who believe even though they don't see. And so that's not a requirement for us to have uh, belief. Uh, Verse 18, And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. What's the significance of Jesus saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? What he says goes. So there, there is... You know, there has been authority with his teaching, even uh, early on in his message there in Matthew 7. It said they were amazed because he, he spoke as one who had authority, unlike the scribes. Uh, so he's been speaking with authority. Uh, now he says, all authority has been given to me. Any other thoughts about this idea of all authority has been given to me?
I think it plays into the concept of the fear of the Lord, the reverence, the awe that we have of God. Uh, and that doesn't just apply to the Father, that applies to Jesus too. And so, um, but also notice here, it's the passive again, right? Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We mentioned the divine passive last, last week. So who's giving the authority to Jesus? God the Father is giving Jesus that authority. Why is he giving him that authority? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that does, you know, it sets the stage for what, what's to come, that he does have the authority. But why, why did it have to be given to him? Right, right. So, <clears throat> based upon the life that Jesus lived, it gave him the right to have all that authority. Now, Jesus had that authority in eternity before he came, but he emptied himself. Right, he gave up that uh, uh, the the blissfulness of heaven, the eternal authority. He gave that up, come to this earth, and now all that authority to me. And then later on in the gospel story, as we see in, in 1 Corinthians, that one day the uh, Father will put all the enemies of Jesus underneath his feet. Okay, And so it's uh, a, a kind of a continual giving of authority to Jesus uh, based upon the life that he lived, based upon the perfect sacrifice that he was. Right. right. And there's a sense um, in the, um, that culture of the firstborn receiving the inheritance and the blessing from the Father. Uh, we don't have it quite in our culture because if you pass away, your stuff will be divided equally. Uh, but at that time, the firstborn uh, child, the firstborn son, had... Uh, had more, um, like more of a, a share of an inheritance. And here Jesus is the only unique son, and so he receives all of it. He receives all authority, all, all, the, um, all the dominion. And um, it, we, we read this a little bit in, um, when we were talking about the trial of Jesus from Daniel 7. And uh, that it was a reference to that when Jesus said he was the son of man, he was going to be uh, coming on the clouds, and they, they viewed that as blasphemy. Um, but that's part of what Daniel 7 says. is not only is, uh, is the son of man going to come in the clouds, but it says there, um, verse 13, Daniel 7, 13, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall, shall not be destroyed. So this is just part of uh, the process, part of God's plan. is because of the faithfulness of Jesus, because of his righteousness, the Father will give all dominion uh, to him and a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Well, yes. And also in, in line with the fact that Jesus is the, is the judge, he has to have all authority you know, for him to be the great judge. To, you know, as Matthew, of course, comments about that a lot too, with him, you know, I will say to this one, this thing, and this one, right. another thing. You know? Yeah, that's a good point. So... Uh, this allows him to be the judge of humanity. I mean, just a, a few chapters before Matthew 25 where he talks about the Son of Man coming in his glory and he will sit on his glorious 
thrones and he's going to separate them between the sheep and, and the goats. And so, yeah, in order for him to have that um, ability to judge, he had to have the authority given to him from his father. Right, yeah, so, you know, God has always been in community as Father, Son, and Spirit, and it's uh, amazing that our God is one that submits to the other parts of the Godhead, like Jesus submits to the Father, a Spirit submits to the Son and the Father. That's amazing to think about, uh, and I think part of that is, is in some sense, humility, you know, they're, they're showing us the humility we ought to have. Even though we're equal as human beings, we, we submit to serve. And that's what Jesus said. He submitted to serve, serve us. All right, verse 19. Uh, because this is true, therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All right, so what is the command here? Okay, go, there's actually two commands. A trick question. Uh, so go is the first one. And, and make disciples. That is, uh, those are the commands. Now, how do you make disciples? Okay, there's an element of teaching. Okay, example. Okay, there, there is a, a baptism. Keep teaching them. Okay, so keep, uh, and, um, keep teaching them further and further what the Lord has said. Anything else? Okay, so not just uh, teach them, but there needs to be some obedience on the back end of that. You see this in, um, in all of the, uh, the accounts. Uh, the one we've read is Matthew 28, but there's a couple other ones that are, are similar. Uh, let's look at those right now. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Um, I believe this is a different instance, but it's a similar topic that Jesus is is uh, speaking about. This is where he appears to the eleven reclining at a table. He says in verse 15, this is Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. All right, so um, is there anything in there that might hint at what it means to be a disciple. If you're going to preach the gospel, you've got to know something about that gospel and the gospel about Christ. And, and of course, you preach Christ as well. Okay, so it's, it's learning, and we've kind of stressed that. There's that teaching that we need to receive to be a disciple. There's also then we take that take up that mantle and we preach, we proclaim. Now, the word preach is the word caruso here. It's this idea of proclaiming or heralding the truth. Is that something that has to be done behind a pulpit? Okay. But that's an expectation, right? An expectation that all of us proclaim in different ways. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. All right, is there anything else here that might make up a disciple? It's a belief, a faith that we have to have, a trust in our God. And then Wendy uh, mentioned there the baptism. All right, look at uh, Luke 24. Verse 
Luke 24, starting in verse 46. And he said to them, Thus is it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. All right. Anything else that might be involved in being a disciple here? Repentance. So um, let's define repentance because I think a lot in our world don't know what that word means. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it comes from the root word changing. And if you're going to change as a Christian, becoming a Christian, what, what happens in your life? That's what you did in the past. That, that's the hope, right? So you sinned in the past. And so what do you do because of that if you repent? Okay, you do better. Let's 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 parse that out a little bit. What's the idea of doing better? Okay, so there's an obedience to it, and what was? Okay, you stop doing the bad stuff. You start doing the good stuff. Okay, it's real simple, but yeah, we've kind of lost that word in our vocabulary. I think sometimes, but yeah, you're you're walking in a direction opposite of God. You make that about face. You start walking towards God, leaving behind the old ways of sin, and then obeying. It's not just uh, sometimes we define our faith by what we don't do. Well, I don't smoke. I don't drink. You know, I don't. <laughs> I don't chew. Whatever. <laughs> what, what is what is the phrase? What do you do? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what you actually do, right, yeah. <laughs> All right. What I was, the phrase I was talking about, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't hang out with those who do. That's the phrase I was looking for, but, yeah, so you, it's, it's about what you, I mean, there is a sense where you leave behind those bad things in the world, but it has to be complemented by a life of service, of making disciples ourselves, of proclaiming, all of those uh, go along with being a disciple. And, and if you uh, want to look at it further, there, um, there are several statements in the scriptures that tell us what discipleship is about, that Jesus said throughout his teachings. Things like, if you are truly my disciple, you will obey me. Okay, what else? All will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay. Um, Jesus uh, talks to his disciples there in uh, Mark 10. He talks to them about how they're trying to vie for leadership. And he says, that's not the way it is among you. That's not how it is among my disciples. That's how it is with the, the pagans and their rulers. But among you, you follow my example, and that is not to... Uh, be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. So Jesus sets out certain things that, that identify us as his disciples, like love, like service, um, like obedience. Um, and so uh, those, are, those are part of becoming a disciple. Okay, so that's what it is to be a disciple. Now let's get back to Matthew 28. How do we make disciples? Y'all mentioned teaching and baptism. Are there any other ways that we can um, help other people to know what Jesus said and to live what Jesus said? What was that? Okay, your example. That's part of it. Okay, so there's teaching. What else? Are you asking before baptism or up to that? Or I'm not sure. I'm not clear on the question. 
The question is, how do we make disciples? We've said example and teach, but that's all we have. Okay, there's uh, maybe getting to know someone fellowship. through fellowship. Okay, so fellowship is part of that too. Fellowship. Okay, that's that's part of it. That's on the front end of it. Okay, so encouragement. Okay, how do you encourage people? How do you encourage people? You talk to them. All right, uh, Lonnie will tell you exactly what's on his mind, so no filter there. Okay, you talk to them, but are there any other ways that we encourage people? Okay, so example, again. Show concern. What does Miss Sarah do all the time? Send cards. I can be a part of it. Okay. What I'm trying to do, and the reason I, I've tried to maybe broaden our understanding of making disciples, is a lot of times I feel like when we read this passage, that our focus is on teaching and having personal Bible studies with people. Okay? And I think that making disciples is much broader than that. Now, certainly we are commanded, as we saw in Mark 16, we are commanded to proclaim okay, to bring the good news, to be a herald of good news, but that doesn't always have to be confined to a personal Bible study. Now, there's certain, certainly people who have that gift. I am one that, that I believe I have that gift, and I know several here in the audience say have that gift, but there are a variety of gifts, and we're going to look at that in the next two Sunday mornings. Um, we're going to look at the spiritual gifts and how we can use our gifts to make disciples, to fulfill the Great Commission. But sometimes I think there's some uh, guilt around it that if we're not doing personal Bible studies ourselves, then somehow we have not obeyed the commands of Jesus. Now, um, and, and the reason I, I say that is because my grandmother, who was a faithful Christian for seven, eight decades. I mean, she was a little over 90 when she passed away. Before she, she passed away, she, she had this guilt within her heart. She expressed it to my uncle by saying, I, uh, I have never taken someone who was a non-Christian and studied with them and brought them up to the point of, of baptism. And because of that, she was unsure if her soul was going to heaven. That was her. Uh, that was her take. Not to mention, she had been teaching Sunday school for seven decades. Okay, she had taught a lot of people about Jesus who weren't Christians yet. Okay, she she taught hundreds and hundreds of kids who later became Christians and lived a Christian life. Not only that, but she raised her kids to love the Lord. So I believe she was making disciples. It might not look like that personal Bible study, but it was a part of, I think, what Jesus has commanded us to do. And so I think we just need to, to remember that. Now, still, we need to proclaim, remember? And your gift might be service, or it might be generosity. And if you just keep giving stuff to people or serving other people and you never mention Jesus to them, what are they going to think? That's a good guy. That guy will give you the shirt off his back. They would, they're going to glorify you. But I think as Christians, we're called to proclaim, to Caruso, to, to herald the good news and say, I'm not doing this because I'm a good person. I'm doing this because of what Jesus has done for me. And so I think that's part of as part of the Great Commission, as part of preaching the gospel to the whole creation, is using our gifts and to use that as a, a, a medium in order to bring them to the Lord. 
Uh, there's a book that I read recently. It was given to us by Jerry Robertson Jr. That was called Bring, Teach, and then it said Keep. Bring, Teach, Keep. And so he divided some of the spiritual gifts into different categories. Um, there's some people that just have a knack for bringing people to the Lord. Can you think of one in Scripture? Who brought Peter to Jesus? His brother, Andrew. There's some people that are great teachers. I think of Philip there in Acts chapter 8. There's also those who are great keepers. Can you think of one in the book of Acts that was a great keeper? Encouraged people? Barnabas, right. Son of encouragement. So he was a, a keeper. And so I like those divisions in some sense when we think about bringing people to the Lord is, is that maybe some of, uh, maybe we need to lean in to those areas that, that we're gifted at. Um, I can tell you the orchards, they're bringers. They are bringers. I, they, have, they have brought more people since I've been here than anyone else. They bring people. Some of it, they, they try to date them and eventually marry them. I'm looking up there at Linus there. That, that helps. But they're bringers, you know. And, and I think Jeremy, he's, he's a teacher. And he has, uh, here recently, he, he had a couple Bible studies with someone. And then I think about the keepers. I mentioned, you know, Sarah before with her encouragement. Uh, we need all of that. Let's just see a show of hands. We just have a couple minutes left. Who, who thinks they're bringers? Show of hands. Okay, no one's a bringer. Who thinks they're teachers? All right, we've got maybe three, four. Who think they're keepers? All right, we've got just a few. Okay, just think about that this week, okay? And we'll get into more. The next few weeks, like I said, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts and see how we can play a part to make sure that we go into all the world and preach the gospel. And if we do, if we do, we have the assurance, as Jesus says there at the end, that he will be with us even to the end of the age. All right, thank you all.
line. I'm going to encourage you to pick up a bulletin. There's several still between the doors there on your way out. If you haven't got one, there's lots of stuff I'm not going to go over, but I will uh, touch on some of the stuff. Mentioned in class this morning, Carolyn and Wilford Bonnell got good health reports. We're glad to hear that. Adam's nephew, uh, Elijah, is in, in the hospital with RSV. Please keep him in your prayers. Terry and Annette couldn't be with us this morning. They're at home sick. Shirley's cousin, Thomas, is having kidney issues and will likely be starting dialysis soon. Molly Cook is, home, is sick with COVID. Connie Linderman, Ray and Doris's uh, daughter, is having health issues and she is going to start an immunotherapy. Lauren Shackelford fell. He was at home. They had to call 911, who had to break the door down to get in. Billy said that he and Jeremy got the lock fixed, got the door shut. But if anybody is good at installing a door, he said, him and Jeremy were not door installers. So he said they can get a door, but if anybody would like to volunteer or help with that, please see Billy or Jeremy. Our condolences to Wilma Parks on the passing of her sister. Uh, graveside services will be tomorrow at the city cemetery. Uh, the Plum family is at home, so uh, please keep them in your prayers. And Betty Stewart is with her daughter in Texas after a, a fall, so uh, recuperating. And Ron Cravens is here with us this morning. It's nice to have him with us this morning. Now, if you'd like to mark your calendar, and I get to read this. Luncheon, the Knowles last Sunday, and tacos with Santa. We will be having a luncheon on December the 18th for Adam and Bethany and the family on the morning services. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. We're going to have a taco Mexican bar, and it says Santa will arrive after lunch. I feel like I need Buddy the Elf up here jumping up and down saying Santa's coming, Santa's coming. But... Uh, so I'm looking forward to giving the guy my Christmas list and finding out what list I'm on. So uh, I hope you kids are too. If you took a name for the buy gifts for the child local project Christmas promised, the gifts need to be here by December the 11th. Uh, the gifts do not have to be wrapped. And you can see Allie Nepian if you've got any questions on that. The ladies Bible study group will be meeting at TO's on Tuesday the 6th at 5 p.m., then they'll be coming back to the building for a cookie exchange. Uh, if you've got any questions there, see Andrea McAtee. Sunday services on December the 25th. Due to the many teachers and members traveling for the Christmas holiday, we're going to meet at 10 o'clock uh, for worship service only on December the 25th. There won't be any Bible classes, and there won't be any Sunday night service. Again, thank you for being with us this morning, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis. On that worship service uh, on Christmas Day, December 25th, uh, Elijah and I are going to combine and have a sermon in song, so I hope you look forward to that. I always do and, and think it's a very meaningful worship. All hail the power of of Jesus name and the second line says bring forth the royal diadem a diadem is simply another word for a particular type of head dressing or a crown crown him Lord of all oh hail the power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all let every kindred every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all 
majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, O oh, music on its own. Awake, my soul, and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, and the blessed Spirit through him given from yonder glorious throne. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Amen. You pray with me. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you blessed us with. We come here to gather with our brothers and sisters to worship you, sing songs of praise to you, and pray to you, and learn of your word. We pray, Father, for those that are sick that Stuart mentioned. We pray that they'll soon regain their health, Father. We, we especially thank you, Father, for all the prayers that you've answered on our behalf for our sick. And Father, we have so many that have lost loved ones recently. We ask you to be with those that they can look to you for the comfort that only you can give. And Father, we pray for our missionaries that we are going throughout the world. We pray that you'll be with them, that they'll have safety on their journeys. Father, and that many more souls can be brought to you. Father, we pray that as we give you this praise and worship today that we can feel what it is to give that to you and we can always do what you want. And we ask you, Father, to be with us as we go out through the world and people can see Christ living in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
well stated. We do give our worship to God. As we uh, prepare for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing this beautiful song about our Savior. <clears throat> Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living As we gather before the uh, Lord's table today, it uh, kind of reminds me a little bit about what an important time that it is for us on the first day of the week. We are um, taking the Lord's Supper today as there are millions of other Christians across the world, whether it's in South America or East Asia, many many, many parts of the world, all over the world. And it's relatively simple if you look at it. It's simple, but it's complicated. So it's simplistic, it's very simplistic because it's made up mainly of two parts. And in those two parts, it's the, the bread and it's the fruit of the vine. Whether it's what we're taking today or what was being taken during the first century of the church, it's basically the same. It hasn't changed, and it wasn't so complicated that something would go out or out of date as time goes on, including in the future, that God will always provide the bread, and the fruit of the vine, as he provides everything for us. But <clears throat> with this, he is not going to allow Christians not to participate, and it is participation in the, in the table, in the fruit of the vine, as well as the bread. So we're going to pick up here in Mark chapter 14. We're going to start with verse 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one of them said to him, Surely you do not mean me. Jesus replied, It is one of the twelve. He replied, One who dips bread into the bowl with me, the Son of Man, will just will go just as it is written with him but woe to that man who betrays the son of man it will be better for him if he had not been born while they were eating jesus took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying take it this is my body then he took a cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to participate in this 
very humbling memorial. As we take this bread, may we keep Jesus in mind. And this we want to pray in Christ's name. Amen. Shall we go to our Father in heaven in prayer? Father, we thank you for this cup that we're about to, to drink and that it represents Christ's blood of the covenant, that we as Christians, we take it in a way that we remember him and what he did for the, for the remission of our sins. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's supper and just as a matter of convenience we have a, a an opportunity now to give back a portion of our of our means and if you are visiting please do not feel obligated to to give if you would like uh, that's up to you but if not if you would just fill out a visitor's card and put it in the plate uh, as the gentleman comes down the aisle, and uh, let's go to our heavy Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for all the worldly blessings that you give us. We especially thank you, though, for the spiritual ones. May we give with a giving heart. We also pray that our gifts are well received and that it hurt, uh, helps Christians and it helps non-Christians alike. Thank you for this opportunity, Father. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you're using a book and want to mark the invitation song after uh, Adam's lesson, that's 501. 501 is O Worship the King. Let's sing a few verses of this song as we introduce the scripture reading and his lessons today. Let's be standing, please. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death. 
nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. We gaze not in the open tomb where once thy mangled body lay, nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth ascend, who raised to him their wondering view. Then low to earth, all prostrate men, but we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies, but we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies. Scripture reading this morning will come from Luke chapter 24. We'll be looking at verses 50 to 53. Luke 24, 50 to 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried into the heaven. And they, after worshiping, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. Good morning. Good to worship with you this morning. Kind of give you an update on uh, where we at, we are at on our move, and maybe some help from you guys. Uh, the plan is uh, next Monday morning to to pack up our first load and take that to uh, to Lebanon. So we'll probably need some help around 9 a.m. in the morning. That's December 12th, Monday, December 12th. I'm going to go at 8 o'clock, get the U-Haul, bring it back, and we're going to take. It's mostly my library and my wood shop, but uh, uh, just need a little bit of help on that on that Monday morning. And so if you can help out on the 12th, uh, please let me know. Make sure we have enough help. And then uh, we'll have our, our last day here on the 18th. And then that Tuesday, that would be the 20th in the morning. We're going to start early in the morning uh, packing up the final stuff of uh, our possessions. So... Uh, if you can help on either of those, on the, the 12th or the 20th, we would uh, appreciate it greatly. And uh, it's becoming more and more sad um, as time goes on, but, um, but uh, you guys have been so good to us, and, and uh, we just appreciate all the words that you have said in the past uh, few weeks. If you have your Bibles, turn there to Luke chapter 24, where Grant just read. Luke 24, starting in verse... 50. My uncle Stephen told me uh, when he was leaving a church in North Carolina to, to start his work with Baxter Institute, he told me whenever you leave a place as a minister, as a preacher, there are going to be some who are crying and some who are clapping. Some who are, are crying because they're sad to see you go. Some are clapping because they're like, good riddance. <laughs> 
You just hope there's more crying than clapping. <laughs> but if you were to put yourself in the disciples' feet this morning in Luke 24 and realize their preacher was leaving, their minister, the guy who had ministered to them the past three years, but, but much more than that, much more than a human preacher, this was the Son of God. This was their Savior. And now he was leaving them. Imagine how hard that might be. I think most of us would think that the disciples, that they would be distraught. They would be in turmoil within. That they would agonize over Jesus leaving. That they would shed many, many tears. But as we pick up the Gospel of Luke, we find out that that is really the opposite of what happened. Reading there, starting in verse 50, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. We look at this, and I think some of us might be surprised. We might be surprised that this is the reaction the disciples had, especially considering their history. Now, certainly, I don't want to be too hard on the disciples. They had their moments of faith. They've had their moments where they confessed Jesus as the Son of God. They've had their, their moments in which they believed and, and kept believing even when other disciples fell away. See, even Peter walked on water because of his faith. They had faith at times. They had those mountain peak experiences I think most of us would say the theme of the disciples' relationship with Jesus is more a theme of doubt than a theme of faith. They had many times where they just, they were just knuckleheads like we are too. So many times. Where it's like, how could you not believe? After all that you've seen, how could you have doubt in your heart? And so as we look at the disciples, we, we, we think you know, maybe even expect them to be totally distraught at Jesus leaving them physically from this earth as he ascends into heaven at the, the right hand of God. But that is not their spirit. Their spirit is one of, of joy. Their spirit is that of worship, of praise and boldness in front of others. That's their spirit, not one that is depressed with great anxiety and many, many tears. And we look at that and say, how did that happen? How did these, these disciples who often doubted, how did they have such trust in Jesus as he left them? How did they have this worshipful spirit? How did they have this joy? I believe the reason is it's not because they were in denial. A lot of us, if you see someone lose a loved one and they are just smiling from ear to ear all the time and they're acting like nothing has happened, we say, well, they're in denial. They're in denial that they have suffered a great loss. I don't think that's what's happening with the disciples. I don't think they're in great denial here. Instead, I believe those 40 days with Jesus has helped them tremendously to see that Jesus ascending into heaven was for their benefit. It was for their good. I think Jesus stressed over and over those 40 days that when he ascended, that when Jesus ascends, any threat to their peace, joy, and hope descends. That because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heaven above, that we as his people can have peace and joy and hope that never ends. And I believe in the, the midst of that discussion that Jesus showed them the reasons why it was for their own good. And I think one of the reasons that, that, they, that Jesus had to have stressed to the disciples is that when Jesus ascends and sits down at the right hand of God, that they as his disciples... And all of us who are Christians, that we have a mediator and an advocate for our sins. There in Hebrews chapter 10, 
Hebrews chapter 10, it speaks about Jesus seated, sitting down at the right hand of God. There in Hebrews 10, starting verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which never can take away sins. But Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from, the time, from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. The image here is that of a priest. A priest, whenever they were offering sacrifices, they had to stand up. They were constantly standing up, offering these sacrifices, and in the end, it didn't remove sin. But then, you have Jesus. He offered his once-for-all sacrifice. He offered himself by dying on the cross, and based upon that, his job was done, and he sat down. He sat down where the priests could not. He sat down because our sins are forgiven. And so because Jesus has offered that sacrifice, and because we have accepted that sacrifice, we now, as Christians, have peace. Before Jesus became our mediator, all of us were enemies of God. All of us, because our sin, had put ourselves at odds with God. But because Jesus has been that mediator, he's done mediation between us, we now have that peace. And that peace is so beautiful. It's hard to even explain. Really, you have to experience it. If there are non-Christians out there, you, you, we can't really accurately explain the peace that we have in Christ. But it is so overwhelming to know that we are at peace with our Creator. To know when we put our heads on, the, on our pillows at night that we're good. No matter what happens in the night, we're good with the Lord. That is a peace that is so, so satisfactory. That is a peace that reigns within our And we have that. We have that because Jesus sat down at the right hand of God. Because he became our mediator in that position of honor before the Father. But also what we find in 1 John chapter 2 is that doesn't just exist after we're baptized. But all along the journey as we try to live for Christ. We find in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 where John said, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, probably should be transla translated, but when you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The image here is that of a courtroom, and Jesus is our defense lawyer. And what happens when we sin, when we mess up, but we still want to walk with God, we still want to have a relationship with him, what happens is when we mess up, Jesus comes to our defense. He says to the Father, these are mine. These are my people. Therefore, they are forgiven. And he doesn't do that because we're especially good people. He doesn't say these guys are good because of how good they are. But he points to his own righteousness. He points to his perfect sacrifice. He points to himself and say, they belong to me. Therefore, they are forgiven. That's part of Jesus being beside the Father there in heaven. It's having a mediation, having an advocate so that we can have a peace that brings joy into our heart. That we can have that peace that, that we can worship even if we might be persecuted. Even if we might face trials. Even if we go through difficulties in life, we can still have great joy. Because Jesus is at the right hand of God. But it's more than that. It's, it's more than just having a right relationship with God. But also Jesus ascending into heaven. What that means for us is not only do we have the power to have forgiveness, but we have the power to live for God. We have God with us, helping us every step of the way. Before Jesus' death, he was preparing his disciples for that death and for that ascension. There in John chapter 16, in verse 7, he says this to his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come. But if I do go, I will send him 
to you. Now, for the disciples, they probably thought that was preposterous in the moment. What? It's for our own advantage, for our own good, for you to leave us? What are you talking about, Jesus? But Jesus says, it is to your own advantage. Why is that? Well, we find there in, in Matthew 28, in verse 20, a passage we, we studied this morning. We didn't get to touch on this as much, but Jesus, at the end of getting the Great Commission, he says, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Jesus here promised his disciples his presence. But we look at that and say, how can he promise that? When he's about to ascend into heaven, how does Jesus promise his disciples that he will be with them? Well, the way that he is with them is that he ascends on high and he sends the helper. He sends the paraclete. He sends this Holy Spirit to help us as we live in our life. And so before Jesus' ascension, he was in one spot, physically speaking. But now that he is in heaven, he is everywhere through his spirit. He's with you right now. He's with this church. He's with every Christian across the world. His power is still there. His presence is still with us. And with that presence in our life, we, we have a great privilege no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we have the privilege of having that power on our side. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, we find the writer of Hebrews talking about the ascension. And he says, this is what he says there in verse 14. This is Hebrews 4 and verse 14. It says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. He's talking about the ascension here. Because Jesus has ascended on high, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like. Verse 16, let us then, because that is true, with confidence drawn near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What he's saying is because Jesus is there on high, all of us, no matter where we are, what we're doing, we can all approach the throne room of God. We can all ask before the Father. We can ask for his help in our life because of Jesus, because he is that great high priest. Because he's at God's hand. We also find in, in Ephesians chapter 1 a discussion by Paul about that ascension. And he shows us that not only can we ask for help, but he has the power to help us in any situation. As Ephesians chapter 1, 20 and 21, it says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. All the powers, all the powers in all the world, all the evil powers, the works of darkness, Satan himself are all under Jesus' feet. Jesus is high above them because he's high above them. There's not a thing that we're going to face this next week that he can't overcome. That if we have faith in him and trust in him and his power and presence in our life, there's not a thing that we face that we cannot overcome. And that's all because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And we don't just have this power at our, our disposal. But we also have a benevolent God looking down on us, trying to help us in our time of need. You know, sometimes we feel when we ask God for something, we feel... Like he's not responding to us. That he's at least not responding to us in the way that we want him to. And so we're, we're, we're torn sometimes. We might think, yeah, God, you have all this power, but you're not helping me. You're not helping me in my situation right now. And so sometimes we look at God and say, what gives? Why, why aren't you coming to my rescue? But what we find in the scriptures is, is, yes, there's times in which God doesn't answer our prayers like we want, the, want him to. At the same time, we can trust that no matter how he answers our prayers, 
that as his children, he's going to give us good gifts. Even if we don't see it's a, a good gift in the moment. And in fact, what we find in the scriptures is that, is that the Lord, even though he is at the, the, the highest of places, you know, you've, you've probably seen people before, they, they get promoted to this high position and then they don't care any, about anybody except themselves. That's not Jesus. He ascended on high because he cares. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What he's saying here is, is when Jesus was raised to the right hand of God, we, figuratively speaking, were raised too. So we're in the throne room of God. And he did this. He did all of this to show grace and kindness to us all. That was the purpose. That was the purpose for the power of Jesus. Receiving all this power and dominion and rule is to bless. It's to give us grace. It's to show us kindness. And so when we pray to God, we can trust that he cares about our problems. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 17, to cast all your anxieties on him. Why? For he cares for you. We don't just have a powerful God. We have a personal God, a God that's involved in our lives, that cares about each and every problem that we face. And there's nothing that can come between us and God if we stay faithful to him. Look with me real quickly in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 34. Again, there's an emphasis here on the ascension, on, on Jesus being enthroned above. He says there in verse 34, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. And so he was raised to do what? To intercede, to pray for us. He is praying for us right now. Jesus is being our intercessor. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's the love of Christ. So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. God didn't promise us an easy life. We're going to have to suffer some of those at times, distress and persecution, maybe even some type of crisis in the world. He said in verse 37, No, in all these we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We can be confident the Lord is on our side at all times, that he cares about us, that his love is still there even when we might not feel it in the moment. And if we can look at the throne of God, it can give us hope, even in the darkest of days. And a big part of that, a big part of, of having hope in the darkness of days is, is to remember that whatever we're facing, it won't be forever. Someone here, I'm not sure who it was, but they posted on Facebook this last week something along the lines of this. They posted something, one great thing about the Christian faith so we know that it's all going to, to have a good ending. That, that no matter what happens to us in our life, that it's going to be a good ending for us all. That everything will work out. And the ascension, it promises that as well. Flip with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. This is uh, the record of the ascension there in the Acts of the Apostles. And it says there, as, as Luke is describing it, he says in verse 9, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so here with the ascension, 
It's a promise. There is a promise there. Not only do we have God's power in our life, not only do we have His peace, not only do we have His presence, not only does He care for us for our own advantage, but here it says that we have a promise that He will come again the same way He left. Just as He left on a cloud, He will descend with a cloud. And when He does that, all of the hope, all the peace, all the joy that we can experience just a little bit right now because he's on the throne will be able to experience to the full. Look there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes to this persecuted church. And as he does so, he says to them in verse 5, this is evident of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Paul is saying to this persecuted church is these people who are persecuting you right now that you're suffering from right now, understand when Jesus comes, all that will be taken away. That God will afflict those who are afflicting you. That any enemies that you face in your life, even the enemies of pain and death, all of those will be done away with when Jesus comes again. And we'll be able to experience peace and joy to the full as we are in the new world with our God, as he has given us a new creation without pain or death or any enemy anymore. And the ascension reminds us he's coming back and there will be one day when his rule will be supreme. We won't have to deal with these difficulties anymore. I hope by reading a lot of these verses, I know I, I gave you a lot here to read and think about, but I hope from these verses that you will see over and over how the ascension and the enthronement of Jesus is a main theme in the New Testament. That it is an important theme throughout our Bibles. That Jesus would become the king to rule over and what that means for us as Christians. And I know we typically focus on the cross. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. We focus on the cross more so than the empty tomb. Or we focus on the cross more than the ascension. But I think the resurrection and the ascension are things that need to be a part of our message so often. They're so important that Jesus was raised and now he is living above. He's mediating for us. He's interceding for us. He's giving us power to live. He's giving us access to God. And one day he's going to make everything right. Yes, the ascension is, is a big deal to our relationship with God. But I think what we find here with the disciples is it's a big deal for our perspective each day. You take these, these doubting disciples who had such many struggles in their faith, and then when Jesus leaves, they have this confidence. They had this, this confidence, this boldness for the Lord, this joy, great joy in their hearts. They had a worshipful spirit, a spirit to praise God. I think we can see their transformation because of the ascension of Jesus. And I hope the ascension will transform every single one of us because Jesus has ascended any threat to our peace, any threat to our joy, any hope, any threat to our hope, it descends, it goes down. Why? Because Jesus reigns over everything. Everything. He reigns over your sins. He reigns over your, your tribulations. He reigns over anything that you face in this world. And if you're struggling as a Christian, if you're struggling with, with peace and joy and hope in your heart in the most difficult of times, let me encourage you, go back to the ascension. Remember that Jesus is at the right hand of God. Remember that he is now the king of kings. I hope this week as we think about this lesson that we'll spend some time each morning thinking about the ascension and the enthronement of Jesus. Just spend some time thinking that just for a minute or two and then what I want you to do is to do what the disciples did. 
is to start worshiping Jesus because of that. We've had some great songs that uh, Dennis has led for us this morning I think will help us where we talk about crowning the Lord as our King. But there's other ones like Lord reign in me or we bow down where we exalt Jesus as King. We remind ourselves that He reigns over all and therefore, they, therefore He should reign in our lives. He should reign in our perspectives. He should reign in our attitudes. And he should make us more joyous, worshipful people as we live our day-to-day life. And so let me encourage you to do that this week. Because when we realize that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, it gives us all kinds of joy. It gives us a peace that surpasses understanding. It gives us a hope for tomorrow. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we are so grateful that Jesus is at your right hand, that he ascended on high and you have given him all authority in heaven and earth, that he is above all of our enemies and all of our trials, that he is, uh, he, he is able to overcome every sin that we've given through his righteousness, that he is interceding for us, that he cares for us, and that he is our advocate day by day before you. And we pray, Lord, as as we live this life, that we will have the perspective of the disciples here. That because Jesus is at your right hand, that we will have great joy in our heart. That we will have great boldness to praise you in front of others. That we will have a worshipful spirit. Give that to us, Lord. Give us that peace. Give us that joy. Give us that hope as we live our lives. And as we await the coming of Jesus, when he makes everything that's wrong in this world, right again. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone out there that, uh, that isn't a Christian and you don't have that peace in your life. You don't have His power in your life. You don't have that relationship with God. We'd love to help you. We'd love to help you have that peace and joy in your heart that only comes with knowing that our Savior is in the highest of places, that we have a friend in the highest of places, and that because of that, we have peace with God and his power in our lives. Or maybe there's someone this, this morning that, that you, you, you have become a Christian, but you're having a hard time with your perspective, you're having a hard time with your peace and joy in your life, and you just need the prayers and the comfort of the congregation. We would love to help you through whatever you're facing. If there's any need, we ask you to come as we stand and sing this invitation song. And gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days. Pavilion in splendor and garden with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Thank you, Adam. I think this is kind of a fun song, so you got to sing it with a fun attitude. We've got a Savior who is in heaven advocating on our behalf, 
and someday soon uh, we get to go see him. And you guys remember, there's a version of this song where uh, at the end of the first line it says, hallelujah, and at the end of the second line it is, hallelujah. So if you remember that, and uh, if you're not afraid to be the only one, uh, <laughs> stick that in there, and I'll, I might pop it in just a little bit. This is uh, soon and very, no more crying, no more dying there. We're going to see the king, so uh, enjoy the song. Then we'll have our dismissal prayer. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more crying there. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, no more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, amen. Let's bow together. Oh Lord, as we come to you at the close of another wonderful opportunity we've had to sing your praises, to worship you. We thank you for all your blessings on this earth. We know that everything that we have come from you, Lord. We pray that as we go, go throughout this week that people will know we are Christians by our actions, not just our words, Lord. We pray that we can all reach out and touch someone else's life in a positive manner this week. Lord, most of all at this time, we'd like to thank you for your Savior. You sent this world, die on the cross for our sins, Lord. We pray that we may live our whole life looking up to that example and that we may strive to be as close to him as we can. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.